Well, good morning, everyone. I'll just uh, give you a quick introduction about myself and also what I'll do for the uh, insect module that I've been asked to participate in. Uh, my name is Hector Carcamo. I'm an entomologist with Agriculture Canada. I've been at the research station for the last, uh, going on, 15 years. I, uh, I work uh, on a variety of insect pests, like ligus bugs, cave seedpod weevil, cereal leaf beetle, pea leaf weevil, some flea beetles, some alfalfa weevils, uh, quite a few things. Uh, but I also uh, have a special interest in uh, natural enemies or predators and parasitoids. These are the good guys that are helping us to keep the bad guys in check. And uh, today I'm going to start by talking about uh, the ground dwelling arthropods. And arthropods is the term that we use when we want to include spiders and daddy long legs and insects. So I will spend a few minutes discussing the importance of preserving and encouraging these ground dwelling arthropods. Uh, then I will spend some time talking about uh, cereal leaf beetle. And if we have time, I will spend some time on uh, pea leaf weevil. But uh, the main message that I want to bring to you is that in every farm, you are going to find lots of beneficial arthropods uh, in your field. And these arthropods, like the spiders, the row beetles, and you will see specimens. I have a drawer with specimens. Uh, we may have a few in the pitfall trap. But all these uh, arthropods are very active, working for you free. They never send you a bill in the mail. You know, they're, they're, they're always doing their work for you. And what, and what they do is they're actually patrolling the ground uh, at all times. And there are uh, specialized species that uh, work during the day. Uh, there are others that work at night. And they're eating whatever they can get. Sometimes they eat each other also, so that's not so nice. But uh, they, will, they will eat essentially uh, a range of insect pests, for example, the pea leaf weevil is a, a, a pest of uh, pole scrubs and a female weevil will lay something like 3,000 eggs. And with so many eggs, you wonder why the entire uh, field or the entire world is not run over by pea leaf weevils, right? Uh, there's so many eggs. It happens that there are many carabi beetles, these ground dwelling arthropods that are actually feeding on the eggs. So a lot of the eggs that are laid by a pest are actually consumed by these beneficial insects. Same thing happens with root maggots. You know, root maggots lay lots of eggs at the base of canola plants. Uh, a lot of those eggs don't actually make it. They actually become food for these karate beetles. So what I'm going to do right now is uh, uh, people often ask me, how do I know if I have these, uh, these insects or these arthropods in my field? And uh, you actually, all of you have it. But if you want to confirm that you have it and you, uh, you want to learn more about what they look like and how to see them, I will show you. It's actually quite simple. And uh, what we do is uh, we use a pitfall trap. Well, if I can get it out of the ground. Okay. So uh, a pitfall trap is basically a very simple device and you can use almost anything. What, what we do when we want to do a, a study, say if a, a, you want to do a long-term study, you want to see what you have in the field from spring to the fall, uh, you can use a one liter plastic container. And I think it'd be easier to remove one of the other ones that we used yesterday. Uh, this, this is one that we, we emptied uh, yesterday. So, so what we're using for our pitfall trap here is uh, essentially very simple. We have a one liter container. You make a hole at the base for drainage because occasionally you may get a bit of rain around these areas. And then you use a, a 500 mil container you, and you cut, cut the top so it, uh, it fits easily in. And usually we put a kind of like a little ring here that allows you to pull it out easier and also provides an, an exit for a drainage also. So that's basically the pitfall trap. And for the uh, killing fluid, you don't want it to be dry because the karabi beetles or the spiders will actually eat each other. So you will end up with one huge beetle that has eaten everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you... You want to put some uh, some uh, 
this is important. Never use your car antifreeze as a preserving uh, oh. liquid because it's bad news uh, for your neighbor's pets. So you want to use the uh, RV antifreeze, the propylene glycol, which is non-toxic. If you're only going to do it for a couple of days, you can actually get away with just using uh, soapy water that actually works just as well to preserve them. So this is the pitfall trap. And uh, if you want to prevent uh, birds or um, other things from eating them, you put this uh, rain cover and also it helps to keep the rain off. And uh, you can almost use anything, uh, so plywood, a uh, couple nails, and then you got your pitfall trap. And this is what... Uh, yeah, but about half an inch, half an inch uh, is good enough because you want you want to allow the space for the for the large arthropods to get through. Some some of the carabi beetles can be quite quite big, and I'll show you some in the. I have some live specimens that we're going to feed uh, feed caterpillars. Uh, there's quite a few species of uh, of these beneficial arthropods. Uh, if you actually were able to sample all of them that you have in your farm, you probably would find something like 200 uh, species of uh, including spiders, daddy long legs, carabi beetles, uh, staphylinid beetles, these row beetles. Uh, there will be other, other uh, less abundant, but those would be the more, even ants also, they actually have a, a, a predation role that they will, they will feed and attack a uh, pest. They will carry caterpillars into their nest. Mm. So it's quite a few different species. And now I'm going to empty the uh, pitfall trap and uh, when it rains a lot, you will find that there's lots of earthworms that go into the traps. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree out of uh, just south of Edmonton and Ellerslie, there were so many earthworms in the traps that I couldn't eat spaghetti for months after a while. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I won't gross you out too much with this one. <laughs> so we actually do have a karabi, uh, karabi beetle. These, uh, these black beetles this is what the carabis look like. So I will pass this around and you will see that there is uh, various uh, sizes. Most of these black things uh, are, are carabids. And uh, there's, there's a few flies here. And okay, I'll, I'll pass this around. You can, you can have a look. So the, uh, a, a few, I'm gonna say a few words about the, the role of these uh, arthropods while you're looking at that. Um, if you know very often we don't acknowledge the importance of these arthropods because when we talk about beneficial insects we tend to focus on the parasitoids the wasps you know something like uh, you, you will hear me talk a lot about T. julius in a moment a parasitoid that specializes on the larva of uh, Sylvia leaf beetle so those those parasitoids those are the uh, we can say the uh, the megafauna of the of the uh, natural enemy world. You know we focus on those, and when we talk about biological control, you know we send entomologists or people, or we have collaborations in Europe or in Asia, and we uh, we ask them specifically find find the wasp that attacks these pests. Like for example, if we want to start a biocontrol program for pea leaf people, we would uh, send somebody to uh, Asia and find those uh, parasitoid wasps because we know that those specialized parasitoids, those are the ones that take 40% of the population. Okay, these, these beetles are the ones that we actually don't acknowledge as much or the uh, spiders because each, each one, each species on its own will not control a pest because they actually eat on everything. They're generalists. However, if you start adding the effects of all of these species, uh, remember we have about, you probably have a hundred species in your farm. If you start adding the uh, cumulative effects of all of these species, the spiders, the uh, daddy long legs, the ground beetles, the raw beetles, then those start to, to, uh, to add up. And imagine what would happen if uh, somehow you were able to remove them entirely. Like if you were, you were to take away all of these uh, ground dwelling predators out of the system, you start to see some things that you have never seen. For example, uh, diamond back moth in our fields. We have some that overwinter in Canada. Not all of them come in the wind. But a lot of the ones that overwinter here get eaten also by spiders. Uh, last year, we had a graduate student from France who, who did an internship with us, and we uh, had a cage study where we manipulated access to the uh, to the plants. And the uh, the cages that allowed. Oh, now we can hear. So I was uh, saying that uh, last year we had a uh, we did a study where we manipulated access to the plants, and we had cages that uh, were open to the ground. And those that allowed access to these uh, ground-dwelling predators, 
those are the ones where we had the highest mortality of, uh, of uh, diamondback moth larva. Uh, especially when you have uh, strong showers, uh, that's when these caterpillars would fall to the ground and then they will become uh, prey and they will be eaten by these carabi beetles and spiders. So what can we do to protect and encourage this uh, free army of beneficiaries that are working for you at no charge? Okay. What you can do is actually quite simple and you probably can guess what I will say. Don't spray unless you absolutely have to spray. Yeah. So if, if, uh, if you know there are economic thresholds for a certain uh, pest, and this is especially important, well, it's important for every insect at every stage of the crop, but it's really important uh, when the, the canopy hasn't developed in the field yet, because that's when you're gonna get the most insecticide falling on the ground and uh, directly affecting the beneficial uh, fauna. Uh, for example, flea beetles, uh, if you have a threshold that you're following, 25% of the cotyledons uh, and you're around threshold, keep in mind that you have this free army of beneficials working for you. So if you're, if you're uh, spraying too quickly before you get to threshold, you're not going to be helping yourself to encourage these uh, beneficial insects to, uh, to develop in your field. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, something that is actually recommended for uh, not just for insects but for uh, diseases and uh, fertility uh, follow crop rotations uh, if you have perennial crops for example alfalfa fields tend to have the the most rich fauna in terms of beneficial arthropods uh, ground beetles and spiders uh, and also the foliage uh, of course uh, lots of coccinella ladybird beetles uh, another important thing is uh, uh, reduced tillage um, if you have more residue, you will find there will be more springtails, uh, colembola, there will be more detritivores feeding on the, uh, on the uh, decomposing organic matter, and then you will also have uh, more of the arthropods developing. So you will have a more complex food web that is developing, and as you have a more complex food web, then you will find that uh, you have more stability in the system as far as you don't have as many outbreaks of uh, insect pests. So those are some things that you can do. Uh, next, uh, I'd like us to go back to the little tent there and I will uh, show you some of these live carabid beetles. Uh, questions? Oh, yes. Um, how does uh, seed applied insecticide affect the, the fawn? I'm assuming it's negative, but you know, what's your opinion around that? That's a good question. The question uh, was how do seed treatments affect the fauna? And uh, the short answer is that I haven't seen any data, so I don't, I don't know the actual answer to it, but I can. We can speculate that it would have lesser of a negative effect compared to a foliar, right? Because the, the uh, insects, the seed treatment is affecting mostly the, is directly affecting the, the, those feeding on the plants. However, something that happens uh, very often in, uh, in any system is something called biomagnification. So you have a, uh, say, a, um, wireworm larva feeding on, uh, on a treated seed or a seedling and you have several of these in the field and you have a karabi beetle or a spider feeding on many of these yeah, then you, you actually have a negative effect also so just because there is no direct feeding by the uh, beneficial insect there could be secondary effects so they, they, they can be quite complex and uh, we, I actually did a study several years ago trying to assess how insecticides applied uh, for ligus on canola affect the ground beetles and we, we noticed something uh, bizarre. We actually found more carabi beetles where you have sprayed insecticide than the uh, unsprayed plots. And uh, the, the answer, or at least my speculation, I think is that because insecticides are, uh, are often stimulate the nervous system of, uh, of animals, including carabi beetles, you actually may have more movement Right, so you, you find more in the traps where it's insecticide because they're actually walking around faster. And then you, fall, they, you see in the traps and you may think, oh, the, the insecticide is beneficial for the insects. You see more of them, but that might not be the case. Any more questions before we move to the tent? And we, we can actually continue the conversation as we go to the tent. Uh, some, somebody asked me the question, are there some insecticides that are better or worse for, uh, for um, beneficials? I guess it would be ideal if uh, the companies could develop an insecticide that only killed the pest and didn't affect the, the beneficial, but uh, most of the insecticides that we have in the market are, are blanket insecticides and they will, they will uh, 
uh, affect the beneficial it's almost the same there is a new product that I don't remember and I, I actually try not to remember the name of product so I, I don't advertise them too much but uh, there is something that I, I remember hearing a, a couple of years ago that that affects plant uh, feeding bugs like ligus bugs, aphids, all those that have sucking mouth parts they have a, like a straw and what this insecticidosis actually prevents the uh, stylet, the mouth part from actually uh, penetrating the, uh, the stem of the plant so that that's something and it, it appears to be soft on uh, on beneficials like bees and some of the uh, parasitoids so it's, it's good to see that the companies are paying attention uh, a lot more these days and actually are trying to develop insects that are, are uh, softer on the beneficial insects okay I, uh, I got a few karate beetles here and uh, uh, I was hoping that they would they would attack the larva that I am placing in but I, I think they're not too happy to be confined in this these little little uh, containers and they're more worried about trying to get out than eating the, what I put there but anyway I'm gonna pass a few of these around and you can see uh, some of these uh, the larger ones are called caterpillar hunters uh, they belong to a genus called Calosoma they actually will climb on plants and trees and there are species that are actually very specialized uh, in forests that will climb uh, quite high in trees to, to search for uh, caterpillars okay there's one there that around I uh, I also would like to uh, to uh, give you a quick introduction to our friend Victor uh, our, our students in the lab have decided they should they should give names to all our insect pets uh, this this spider is a very typical uh, wolf spider and uh, the uh, the uh, name is actually very very accurate and descriptive uh, wolf spiders are, are very hairy in appearance and you can distinguish them uh, quite easily if you have good eyes or you use your magnifying glass if you can you will see that they have eight eyes but the four eyes in the middle are very large and that gives you an indication of the time when they're active hunting so wolf spiders tend to be uh, day hunters there are several other spiders in many families that are specialized at uh, night hunting they're wandering spiders the trapdoor spiders there's uh, quite a few uh, uh, there's uh, probably about half of all the spiders that we have in uh, in the prairies belong to a family called Linifida and they are only about two or three millimeters and you probably haven't seen many of them but those are the most abundant ones that live in the in the leaf litter and uh, in the in the ground and they're very important also for feeding on small insects and uh, also on eggs okay this is the wall spider so beware some of you might not appreciate spiders as much as I do so this this uh, one liter container has the spider and if you don't like to get it too close if you really are brave you can uh, stick your hand and pull it out uh, by the way uh, just a bit of a uh, bit of uh, arachnological trivia we often get this question asked uh, quite often uh, are spiders poisonous to humans we only have one one spider in uh, in in the prairies the black widow that is is somewhat poisonous to humans and all spiders have poison, right? They have venom that they use to catch their prey. Uh, and they, uh, the spiders actually don't like to waste their venom on us because the, the venom is, is of no consequence. It would, be, it would be less poisonous than a bee sting. So in, in most cases, spiders do have venom, but it is not active on, on humans. And the black widow is the only spider that would actually be a, be a problem if you have some kind of health issue. Uh, a baby, a senior with a heart condition, but otherwise uh, it wouldn't be any different than having a, a bee sting you. Of course, they're a lot more scary, especially after you've seen all those uh, spider movies. <laughs> I want to share a story because it's perfect. We're out, um, when we're out raiding plots a lot, it kind of gets a little tedious and boring. So I'm not, you don't have to share this with everybody, but if you look at those wolf spider nets, they look like a little funnel of a net they've got. <coughs> And then, okay, so you've got this neat little thing sitting around, and then you've got mosquitoes attacking you. So there's no better way. It's like sweet revenge. You catch a mosquito, and you go over to the little funnel and drop it on the on the on the net, and all of a sudden you'll see that wolf spider shoot up and eat the mosquito. So it's sweet revenge, and it's great entertainment when you're really bored. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice story. Um, 
Are there any questions about uh, karate beetles or spiders? Uh, we do have a drawer here that, um, let's see. Maybe we, we can pass this around with a couple people. So here you can see some, <coughs> a lot of these are ground beetles, <coughs> karabide, and there's also staphylinid beetles. These ones that have their longer shape and the, uh, the elytra, that's the name we use for the wing covers that are hard for beetles. The uh, wing covers do not cover the entire body. You can see part of their abdomen exposed. Those are the staphylinide or row beetles. And this family is actually the most abundant family of any insect in, in Canada, uh, row beetles. Uh, the carabies will be pretty close with numbers of species, but th these are the most uh, species group in, in Canada. Uh, most of these are carabies. Uh, there's some uh, ladybird beetles and some cereal um, uh, leaf beetle there also that you can see. So you can pass this around. <coughs> these, these are all carabidae. You know, the, the carabids can actually range in size from as uh, small as uh, two or three millimeters and they can be as large as uh, you can see there. The, some of them can be almost an inch long. So quite a range. So it's, uh, it's good to have this diversity of carabidae because they actually will feed on, a, on quite a range of crop pests. So they will, there's a species called Bendidion quadrimaculatum. And I, I think that's in the test later on today, right Ken? This, this species, uh, Bembidion quadrimaculatum, this is actually an important species. We had a graduate student working on pea leaf beetle, and she could show that uh, these beetles actually feed on lots of, uh, of the eggs. Uh, I'll pass this around too. So that, that species is only about uh, three millimeters long and uh, probably two millimeters wide, so they're, they're, they're quite small. And you actually see those, you can see them on the ground uh, later on if, if once it gets uh, warm enough and they really like open exposed areas, uh, warm areas and they're very, very abundant. Yeah. Is that rabbit beetle only localized to Canada? Uh, say that again? Is the rabbit beetle only localized to Canada? Uh, is it endemic to Canada? No, is, is it all over the world? Or oh, the rabbit beetles, are they uh, only found in Canada? No, actually rabbit beetles are uh, found everywhere in the world. This is a a family within the, um, the Coleoptera, that's the order of the beetles. So this, this family is widespread everywhere. Uh, the interesting thing is that in, in temperate areas, you know, wherever it's cooler, you find that Karabi beetles dominate the ground habitat. So they are kind of the, the lions of the, of the uh, ground in, in Canada, the US. However, if you go to the tropics, Something interesting has happened there. The, uh, the ants have actually taken over the ground and the carabid beetles are only found in the trees. So they are displaced by the ants on the ground and the, the, uh, you still find them. So carabid beetles, there's probably about 20,000 species worldwide and they occur everywhere, wherever there's land. Some of them are also, uh, have also in various semi-aquatic habitats. So you find them in marshes. Uh, in sand dunes. Uh, tiger beetles are related. They, uh, there's some disagreement among taxonomists whether the tiger beetles are carabies or not, but they're very, very similar. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, those are uh, colors. Some, some, some of these are, uh, are extremely beautiful in, in appearance, but maybe the, I'm a little bit biased about that. But they, are, they can be quite shiny, and actually, some people actually make earrings out of them. They, they coat them with gold and they have a very, very uh, shiny luster on their bodies. So those are the uh, ground dwelling arthropods. So uh, hopefully I have uh, delivered the message that uh, you all have them in your field and they are working for you free, no charge. Uh, so do what you can to protect them and uh, what you do to protect them is, uh, I guess it's, it's not too difficult. Follow the economic thresholds monitor your insect pest and uh, only spray if, if you absolutely have to spray. Okay, I would like to move on and talk about the Syria leaf beetle and um, uh, I know that uh, most of the modules here were supposed to be on ground uh, dwelling uh, issues but I would like to spend a few minutes on the Syria leaf beetle and the reason why I like to talk about the Syria leaf beetle for a while is, is related to the same theme of beneficial uh, arthropods and beneficial insects. Uh, I think I've got a nice photo here if anybody has not seen a Syria leaf beetle or maybe it's actually it's in the uh, that that handout if you turn that yeah that is the 
the uh, Syria leaf beetle is a, is a very uh, colorful insect and we have a beneficial insect that is a, uh, a flower beetle that is very common in, uh, especially in canola and alfalfa that belongs to another family which is actually and is a beneficial insect but you can distinguish them because there's some difference in the antenna and also the coloration. The, uh, if we look at the, uh, the picture of the Syria leaf beetle you can see the, the, uh, the tip of the abdomen is not showing in this uh, one and uh, if you were to look at that beneficial insect the tip of the abdomen is of a different color, it's more orangey. Otherwise the color pattern would be uh, easy to confuse. The uh, cereal leaf beetle is considered a potentially serious pest of uh, almost every cereal crop because it's not very picky about what it eats. You know, it doesn't really care too much if you, uh, if you uh, give them wheat, barley, oats, they will even feed on corn, uh, even wild oats. So <clears throat> we're hopeful that they will uh, become a beneficial insect if they take out all your wild oats. But <clears throat> um, the uh, Sierra Leaf Beetle is a kind of bad news, good news story. It's bad news that we have it. Uh, it's pretty much widespread throughout southern Alberta. We have uh, found, found it uh, south of Highway 1. Uh, I got my students to place some signs all along Highway 1 saying, no Sierra Leaf Beetle to cross over Highway 1, and it <laughs> seems to be working quite well so far. <laughs> For some reason, we don't get many of the insect pests to, to uh, become abundant north of Highway 1. We've seen that happen with cabbage seedful weevil, pea leaf weevil, and also Syria leaf beetle. So it must be uh, uh, quite a difference in climate that is preventing them from getting established north. But in the south, they're quite established and becoming widespread. We really have not seen the densities that should warrant spraying. And uh, this is the, the point that I want to, uh, to drive home about this Syria leaf beetle. The, uh, Economic threshold for cereal leaf beetle is uh, three individuals uh, before the booth stage. So before you have a flag leaf on the cereals, the economic threshold is three individuals. That means you could, you could find a larva, an egg, or an adult on the plant. And you have to have three of them on a plant. And uh, the way to monitor is to uh, collect 10 stems. Or 10 tillers. Uh, the sweep net is a good way to determine whether you have it there. But just because you sweep and you find the cereal leaf beetle, which you will find, if you like, you can you can place that there. Thanks. So the uh, the way to monitor is to collect 10 tillers and then look at the number of uh, or observe how many adults you will have there and how many larvae or eggs. The eggs are not are not too difficult to uh, to identify. They are uh, kind of bright orange, especially when they're freshly laid and cylindrical barrel shape and they're laid in the middle of the leaf. Uh, that is the threshold for uh, the crop stage before the booth, or before, before you have a flag leaf. Once you have a flag leaf, uh, then the threshold changes. And the threshold is one larva per flag leaf. So you would need to take uh, 10 plants, find 10 larvae, and then repeat that at 10 different spots. You don't want to just do it in one spot. And it, uh, the cereal leaf beetle also has an aggregated pattern, it's very similar to uh, cabbage seed or weevil or pea leaf weevil or, or a flea beetle. So you have more of them along the edges of the field. Uh, but you have to have an average of, uh, of one per flag leaf. Now, the reason it's important to uh, to follow these thresholds is because uh, I mentioned the, this uh, insect is a case of uh, bad news, good news type of story. And the good news with this insect is that we actually have a very effective parasitoid that attacks the cereal leaf beetle and it actually takes a large proportion of the population. Now we are seeing uh, up to one third, uh, 40%. And uh, if you were to visit the Creston Valley where they have introduced this parasitoid for a longer period of time, you find that the proportion of beetles that are attacked by parasitoid goes from about 70% to 90%. So very, very effective parasitoid. And I, I do have a, um, a sample to show you somewhere. I have a, a vial, or used to have a vial.
should have a, a pin specimen somewhere here of a... Looks like I've, I've lost my T. Julius. But anyway, I, uh, you know, we have all these uh, Latin names and we don't have common names uh, for this beneficial insect. But I, I hope that this name starts to become a common name for all of you. So if you don't remember anything else from my presentation today, I want you to remember this name. Okay. Uh, first, I will use the long name and that might be too long. Tetrasticus Julius. Okay, that's too long. So just remember T. Julius. <laughs> okay. okay, remember this. this. This parasitoid is really important for the control of the cereal leaf beetle. And it's a very tiny wasp. And uh, hopefully, I, I'm sure I will find it as soon as you leave. And then I will, I will bring it at lunchtime to show it to you. But this, this little black wasp is only about uh, 2 millimeters long and uh, 1.5 and millimeters. So not that big and it's pretty easy to miss. But it's, uh, it's extremely effective uh, to control the cereal leaf beetle for a couple of reasons. One, it's quite mobile, and we don't know exactly uh, how far it flies, but uh, for a small insect, it must be able to, to fly a long way because we did not introduce it to Lethbridge. I wish I could take credit for uh, introducing it to Lethbridge. I usually get the credit for introducing the bad pest, but uh, somebody told me yesterday that entomologists usually introduce a new pest to a region every three years for, uh, for uh, job security. Uh, <laughs> I assure you that's not the case. <laughs> Anyway, this uh, T. Julius is, uh, is uh, very good at uh, finding the cereal leaf beetle, so it, it can track it uh, somehow. We're, we're not sure why. They can probably smell it from far away. Uh, you probably know the cereal leaf beetle has a very nasty habit. Uh, the larvae like to cover themselves in their feces, and they use that as a protective measure against birds or so, uh, so small vertebrates. Uh, small children don't like to eat cereal leaf beetles. <laughs> but... Uh, this doesn't work against the, uh, the T. Julius wasp. Uh, it, it seems that uh, the fecal coat on the larva actually helps the T. Julius to find them so they, uh, they can track them and attack them quite easily. And uh, we are planning to have a, uh, I think maybe sm Farming Smarter already has, do you guys have the, uh, the video of T. Julius attacking the larva on your website? I think we sent it to Jamie at some point. If, if, sure. if not, we should put it on, but uh, our graduate student, uh, Sarup Kerr, who's at the University of Alberta working with Lloyd Dossard and myself, he actually had enough patience to shoot a video and he could show how the, the wasp actually finds the larva and stings it. Uh, it takes uh, actually a, quite a few minutes uh, riding the larva and stinging it and laying eggs. And each T. Julius wasp will lay about five or six eggs inside the larva. And and then the, uh, the parasitoid will develop inside, uh, become a, a, a large, larger uh, larva, then they will exit, and that, that, by that time there's not much left of the larva, they are, they're eaten from the inside. They will come out and then you have five or six uh, pupa that will develop and in, about, in a couple of weeks you have another generation of, uh, of T. Julius adults and this is why they're effective, they, they can track the pest and they can also develop a second generation so they will uh, attack the young larva first and then the new generation will, st will continue searching for the older larva and uh, will, they will find them and that way the populations are reduced and, and generally where we introduce T. Julius we expect to see an increase in the numbers and uh, in, in given, given enough time then we expect the populations of uh, cereal leaf beetle to stay low and not have too much of a problem with them. I, I like to uh, pass around some uh, examples of. Oh, here it is. Okay, here's this cage has the adults, and if your if your uh, plants are looking like that, then you really have high numbers, and you should be thinking about spraying. Otherwise, you shouldn't be. And here is the the uh, T. Julius parasitoid that you can have a look at. They're they're kind of small, so you can use your your fancy magnifying glasses that uh, that. Can gave all of you. And this this one shows a, an example of a plant that had lots of adults. So none of the plants in the field will actually look like that. The damage by the adults, the, it looks like somebody has, uh, has made windows, complete windows uh, on the foliage. The larva looks more like uh, window panes. So they, they don't. Uh, uh, feed through the tissue, they just just uh, strip the epidermis of the of the foliage, and you get these uh, window panes. 
So that's the damage by the adults, and then the, there's larvae in the in the other container. So the the uh, main message that I want you to remember about the cereal leaf beetle is that I I could almost bet money that there will not be a field that actually has high densities that warrant spraying. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of surveying this year, and we have uh, found there are two hot there are two hot spots where we have the highest numbers of cereal leaf beetle. One is where we initially found it in high densities, is the around Tabor, Bow Island, Vauxhall, and uh, the highest densities we've seen there are about two or three larvae per 10 plants. So that's way below threshold. And even though you can see them, you, know, you can see the larvae and you can see the damage, it's easy to spot. It doesn't mean that you're going to be suffering uh, yield losses just because you have them at those densities. Uh, the other area where we, we know that this uh, hot spot is uh, around Warner and Milk River. So there are some sites that, uh, that have high densities. And I've uh, heard of a couple cases where people actually have sprayed. And uh, of course, it's your decision to spray. Uh, but if you do, I would really appreciate if I, if I could come to the field and at least collect the larva and be able to determine whether the parasitoid has reached that area. And the reason why we're collecting this data is because we actually have a, an ongoing project uh, funded by the Pest Management Center for the Culture and Agriculture Canada, and we are relocating the parasitoids. So I have a technician busy at work right now who is rearing lots of uh, beetle larvae, not to release them to your field for my job security, but to actually to expose them to the parasitoid, and then we are uh, releasing the parasitized larvae or the cocoons, and we intend to do this in, uh, in as many fields as we can find, and we are trying to focus uh, especially in the, uh, around the ages of the area where we know we have the beetle. Uh, for example, uh, southwestern Saskatchewan, uh, we have reports of beetles that uh, appear there, so we, we are going to de determine what the level of parasitism is, and if we don't have the parasitoid, we intend to relocate them. And uh, if there are people here who have seen larvae in their fields, we'll be happy to send a student to come and collect and uh, see whether you need parasitoids, and we'll try to release as many as we can. So that's why it's important that we, uh, we really do not spray these fields uh, unless we actually have the very high densities that, that are required for economic thresholds. When you uh, said the threshold, you said three per plant before flag leaf. Uh, is that three larvae or three beetles? Could be either. Before the, uh, before the flag leaf, you count everything. So say you, you um, identify ten plants in an area right and then you observe how many beetles there are there say say you would have to have uh, if in one plant you may have one beetle one egg and one larva and you'd have to have that average of three individual of of any stage in each plant can you maybe redefine the egg side of it you said they're they're bright orange and which leaf are they on are they front to the back uh, they they would be on uh, on top of the leaf and they would be on the mid vein of the leaf and in the middle. They're actually, and they're laid singly, and sometimes you have more than one on, uh, on a leaf. Uh, we may have some here. Uh, I don't think we have any to show you, but uh, they're, they're actually quite distinctive. Uh, we don't see too many, too many uh, eggs that are like that. What time of year would you see the eggs? Uh, the eggs, you see them earlier on, but uh, the beetles can live for a while. So you, you find most of the eggs in late May, early June. And around this time, the, most of the population will be, will be uh, larva. You don't find as many eggs and probably fewer adults. But uh, you will find the odd, odd egg. Uh, the populations are not synchronized. Uh, we noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago that you could go to a field and find mostly uh, medium to large larva. And another field 10 kilometers away would have mostly uh, adults and eggs. Uh, but at this time, you see mostly larva. Uh, the, the best place to actually find the beetle is uh, winter wheat, uh, initially, because that's the first crop that's often growing vigorously, and you find the adults are abundant in winter wheat. Uh, later on, they will move on to, uh, to other fields. Uh, they, uh, they could have a preference for oats in some cases. Are there any questions about the cereal leaf beetle? I feel like we can put that back. So if you see an abundance of eggs, is there anything you can do? 
um, you'd have to wait until they uh, they hatch because the insecticides do not kill the eggs. But um, more than likely, you won't have the high numbers. But uh, there's no insecticide that affects the the eggs. So you're better off just to, like, on average, people don't usually spray for two eggs. Right? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, I we're hoping that you you should never have to spray for them if if the uh, parasitoid continues to increase. And we have actually seen the parasitoid work in uh, in uh, eastern U.S. In Canada, they've had the cereal leaf beetle. And as long as they don't till the fields, uh, this is another important thing, uh, the parasitoid uh, would drop to the soil and, and overwinter in the soil. So if, uh, if you till the soil, that reduces the survivorship of the, uh, of the parasitoid. Now, do we have time or are we out of time? Okay. Pretty much out. Pretty much out? Okay. <laughs> if you have any, any questions about pea leaf weevils, uh, you can catch me at lunchtime. Uh, all I wanted to mention about pea leaf weevil is that just because you see a lot of damage on the foliage, it doesn't mean that uh, you have a pest problem. For example, here, when you, when you uh, go through the mycorrhizal and the soil microbiolo microbiology component, talking about the rhizobium, uh, you will find that there's not many nodules in some cases because nitrogen was high. The pea leaf weevil is not uh, uh, even a uh, is a mute point if there are no nodules because they the adults feed on foliage, the larvae feed on the nodules. So if there are no nodules, you are, you're starving the the beetles. The only exception I say to that is if you've got really high infestation of pea leaf weevil when the crop is very small, and you'll notice that this afternoon when we're looking at Kevin Zaychuk's uh, module where we've got very small peas where they're actually getting cut off. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, it it happens very rarely in a commercial field. I've heard of one instance uh, where they were worried about it was an alfalfa uh, at the seedling stage, and they had lots of pea leaf weevils. Or uh, it, it could actually be another weevil related to the pea leaf weevil because we also have native. Uh, the, this pea leaf weevil belongs to a genus called Cytona, broad nose weevils, and we have sweet clover weevils. And we have some other species that are related and similar, and they all feed on, on the foliage. So if you have lots of them feeding very early on, like Ken said, then you have a problem. But in commercial situations, uh, we hardly ever see that, that uh, occur. It, it occurs quite often in small plots where the, the proportion of the land is too small, and then they overwhelm the site. Yeah, I guess we're done. Join me, Join me in thanking Hector.